What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, strengthsandsneakers.com. I want to give a shout out to Joshua Kelly who always asks great questions on the channel and has a lot of interesting topics that he wants covered and things that, you know, they that are basically make me investigate and do more work on. So it's good, it's good for me to learn as well. Now, the specific question was regarding sort of addictive potential of medications that we prescribe in psychiatry. Um, the one I can comment specifically on, I think, is benzodiazepines. I can give a pretty reasonable discussion on the addictive potential of that, but the data on this information is like kind of limited in some ways, and I'll explain that in a future video. But for this video, what I want to do is I really want to just kind of cover the basics of benzodiazepines because I think people don't fully understand how they work, what they do, etc. So why don't we start there and then in a subsequent video we'll talk about the addictive potential of these medications. So the first thing I want to bring up here is the GABA-A receptor. So benzodiazepines along with other things like GABA which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. This is the one that we think about when we're trying to again bring things down or inhibit things, we think about GABA. So GABA is binding there, benzodiazepines are binding there, alcohol functions on this GABA-A receptor, as well as neurosteroids and barbiturates. So there's a lot going on, there's a lot of potential, not only um, agonists, but allosteric modulators, so modulators of the GABA-A receptor. Now specifically the benzodiazepines are going to bind between that alpha and gamma subunit. And they're going to act, like I said, as allosteric modulators. So what they do and how they function is when they bind to the GABA-A receptor, they're not fully and they're not full acting as full agonists. What they're essentially doing is they're increasing the conductance of chloride ions across this ionotropic. Channel. I want to make a quick comment about the chemical structure of these drugs or medications. And if you look at the chemical structure of GABA, which I have here as well, you'll see that the structure of the benzodiazepines is very different. And again, because that's not binding specifically to the GABA site, it's binding to, again, this other site on the GABA-A channel. So it's not the same location, thus the molecules don't look similar. But the one thing you'll notice about all of the benzodiazepine drugs that I have shown here in the, in the molecular structures is that they all look very, very similar. There's not that much difference in terms. There's some differences in side chains and, and groups within the molecular formulas, but there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of the medication as a molecular structure. So what that's going to tell us is that most of these drugs are probably going to work the exact same. All right, so I want to cover a little bit about the clinical psychopharmacology of these medications. Now I said before you can kind of look at their chemical structure and you can see that they're all similar in terms of that, in terms of that facet. Now, since they're all similar, they all have a similar mechanism of action. And what is that mechanism of action? So basically what happens is it binds to the benzodiazepine receptors, right? Binds to GABA-8 receptors. It's located between the alpha and gamma subunits, and that's going to be the mechanism by which, again, it, the, it increases the conductance of chloride ions through the channel, which is going to hyperpolarize and decrease firing. So it's a little complicated from that perspective, but that's basically the mechanism of action. So how do these drugs differ then? If they all basically have the same mechanism of action, what makes them different? And what makes each one different is really the properties of each individual drug. And that's things like half-life, so how long does it take for a 50% reduction, and speed of onset. How fast do they start working? So it's those two concepts, half-life and speed of onset, that will really make a lot of the difference in terms of the medications. Another important point that I want to bring up is this idea of dose equivalence. And dose equivalence is also important when you're talking about benzodiazepines because not all of these are the same potency. So what does that mean and how does that look? Let's get some practical examples under our belt so we can understand this better. So let's take clonazepam or clonopin one milligram per day. Let's say somebody's prescribed one milligram per day of clonopin. What does that work out to in terms of equivalence of lorazepam, which is also known as Ativan, and Valium or diazepam? So one milligram per day of clonopin is equivalent to four milligrams a day of Ativan, which is equivalent to 20 milligrams per day of Valium. 
So this is pretty significant. You can see the potency, obviously, of clonopin is much more, much higher than ativan and valium. You have to take much lower dose of clonopin to get essentially the same effect you would on a higher dose of ativan or valium. Now the same thing, we can look at that same example again of clonopin. Let's say somebody's taking four milligrams per day, which would be a relatively high dose, probably one I wouldn't be prescribing on a regular basis. That's equal to 16 milligrams of ativan per day and 80 milligrams of valium per day. So significant differences in terms of the potency of these drugs. Another couple of cl important clinical points I want to point out here is that the benefits for these medications are largely shown to be short-term benefits. There's not much evidence or data even to kind of indicate what the long-term effects of being on benzodiazepines actually are. So short-term benefits. And we also have some randomized controlled data for alprazolam, which is Xanax, and the, to show it has some efficacy in major depressive episodes. Kind of interesting considering we don't normally think of this medication as something related to ma treating major depression. So I said in a previous part of this video that the main differences are in half-life and dose equivalence and speed of onset. So half-life and speed of onset are the two topics I really want to talk about here briefly just because it's going to help us to understand this idea of the addictive potential of these medications. So let's start with Alprazolam or Xanax. The half-life is really short for this drug, and this is one of the reasons why we think it's the most addictive of the, of the class. The half-life is 6 to 12 hours, and also the speed of onset is very short. So it's only 30 minutes. The so speed of onset is 30 minutes, which is also short. So not only do you have a short half-life, meaning somebody's going to need to take the drug more often or feel the need to take the drug more often when the effects wear off, but you also have a very rapid onset. And I've said before in previous videos, one of the reasons why I use extended release if possible, specifically with things like stimulant drugs, is that that speed with which the drug gets into the bloodstream and that, sp and that, and that release is a lot of what we think has the potential to be more addictive. So the faster the speed of onset, the more addictive. And that's why, again, Alprazolam or Xanax is kind of seen as the most addictive of the benzodiazepines. Now, lorazepam or Ativan, this is, falls right in the middle. The half-life is about 10 to 20 hours, and the speed of onset is one hour. So this is more of a medication you would use in a PRN case. Somebody's having an acute episode of a severe anxiety or a panic attack or something like that. This may be a good option in those cases because you can prescribe it as needed. The next one we'll look at is clonopin or clonazepam, which has a long half-life. And I've used these three examples because they show the full spectrum of, of the benzodiazepines in terms of half-life and speed of onset. So clonopin, long half-life, 20 to 50 hours. Uh, speed of onset is also long. It takes about one to four hours to start working. And this one, again, we think is the least addictive, but also it's the most potent and most sedating. So while this one is least addictive or has the least addictive potential, it also has the longest it also has, is the most potency as well as the most risk for sedation.